डॉक्टर दीप्ति रुकाडे इज वर्किंग एज प्रोजेक्ट प्रोजेक्ट रिसर्च साइंटिस्ट एट आई आई टी बॉम्बे शी हैज डन हर मास्टर्स डिग्री इन सॉलिड स्टेट फिजिक्स ड्यूरिंग टू थाउजेंड सिक्स टू थाउजेंड एट एट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ मुंबई एंड डन हर पी एच डी इन मेटल ऑक्साइड नैनो कॉम्पोजिट्स यूजिंग आयन बीम एट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ मुंबई ड्यूरिंग टू थाउजेंड टेन टू थाउजेंड सिक्सटीन she has experience of research associate at iit bombay in december 2017 and full time research scholar at university of mumbai from february 2010 she also worked as content developer during january 2009 to january 2010 for elevate learning she has published several journal papers she has been awarded as the best poster award in dae solid state physics symposium during september 2012 and also she has been awarded as the best poster award dae for atomic molecular and optical physics during march 2011 we welcome you ma'am uh, on behalf of spc and so in this fdp uh, so over to you ma'am for the presentation yeah thank you uh, all of you for uh, such a nice introduction and uh, just give me a moment please yeah a very good afternoon to all of you again and i would really like to thank uh, professor kiran for this invitation for the uh, atal sponsored faculty development program and today i am here on behalf of iit bombay uh, and we would mostly be talking about or uh, i'll give you an overview of uh, what the fabrication facilities we have at iit bombay so before i start uh, one question i would like to ask i hope i am audible to all of you Yes, you are audible. Yes. Audible, audible. Nice, uh, clear, uh, clear, or uh, clear uh, sound. Yes, sir. No problem at all. Okay, thank you, sir. So another thing that I would like to say is, please uh, be free to uh, stop me at the moment that you are not able to hear me or something, or you have any queries. So I'll just share my screen, and then we can move ahead with the talk. is the screen visible to all of you yes it is visible yes so um, the iit bombay houses a nano fabrication facility that has been established quite long back in the department of electrical engineering so here this facility was started by a group of few faculty members headed by professor zuzair wasi and which was followed by many faculty members from many different streams joining in which now results around we have 60 faculty members from all over departments of iit bombay which are using and which are using this facility so to move ahead the flow of my talk would be i would be talking about the deposition tools that we have the oxidation and annealing furnaces the lithography systems the etching tools the characterization tools the miscellaneous tools the policies that we follow and how can we use the facility how can you avail this facility so to start with basically uh, uh, professor kiran uh, and actually given me an overview of the participants so keep in that in mind i have uh, tried to summarize all the details uh, taking into account that this uh, talk is based on mems i'll start with the basic fabrication step that is the diode processing and then i'll go ahead where and which places do we require what facilities and what are the facilities and their optimized standards at iit bnf laboratory so as you can see on the screen uh, i have just explained a schematic of the diode fabrication processing 
where we start with the basic silicon wafer which is followed by oxidation here uh, our oxidation comes into picture we have few furnaces we can either deposit the oxide or we can grow the oxide so i'll go into more details and the flow of the talk followed by oxidation then we need to go for lithography so lithography means what we'll do is in that case um, we will expose the we will spin a photoresist onto the substrate we expose it to a specific uv light due to which uh, the resist either hardens or it softens and depending on that what structure we need we do the development after that we need a metallization so i'll also be discussing on few metallization tools followed by again lithography tools or maybe some implantation tools to start with the deposition tools we have a series of deposition tools which fall under the category of physical vapor deposition as well as chemical vapor deposition so here i have shown pictographically what what tools do we have and i'll quite i'll quickly give a summary of what tools and what is the principle basic principle behind them so let us start with icp cvd as you can see in the first corner that is a icp cvd system which is a inductively coupled plasma chemical vapor deposition at iit bnf so in this uh, icp cvd system uh, all of you must be aware that it is a chemical vapor deposition in which what happens is there is creation of plasma and there are various uh, chemical reaction processes that occur in the plasma with the chemical species and you get thin films that are deposited the tools that are put up on this slide currently all have a basic all are vacuum uh, tools and all have a base pressure of around minimum 10 raised to minus 6 so all the processes that are carried out in these tools they are all done with a minimum vacuum of 10 raised to minus 6 torr now as we move ahead you can see the pld tool that is the pulse laser deposition tool what happens in the pulse laser deposition is we have laser pulses that hit on to the target material so your target material is something that looks like a tablet and uh, it is placed in front of the laser beam so what this laser beam does is it comes and just hits the target and the uh, what happens is that uh, there are the target is sputtered there is also plasma in the system so that sputtered uh, vapor material it mixes with the plasma and forms a uh, something that is called as plume this plume then moves towards the substrate with the applied bias and gets deposited onto the substrate now pld uh, it is a very um, you know unique and a special technique why so because uh, you might have uh, known about many normal uh, you know the basic deposition techniques that we have thermal evaporation or the sputter system uh, so pld the thing is it it has advantages over the other techniques in the sense it can be used for complex ceramic material deposition mostly like the high tc superconductors or magnetic materials now here at iit bnf what we call it as iit bombay nano fabrication facility we have four pld's you might find during the course of my talk that we have the same tools which are maybe repeatable or we might have two evaporators or something that is because we have dedicated tools due to the contamin anti contamination policy that we are following so in that case we have four pld systems one which is dedicated only for silicon the second it is only for 3 phi semiconductors and uh, you know the third it uh, depends for maybe you can use it for metals and fourth one is open for users so that was used under the inup program which i'll be giving a glimpse at the end of my talk so why is it an open access and not a controlled or restricted access is so iit bombay nano fabrication facility is not restricted itself to only uh, you know the fabrication thing we are open up to uh, allowing users to use the characterization facilities only or the deposition facilities only depending upon their requirement so mostly in pld if uh, i i hope uh, most of you must be aware about it and uh, most of you must be used also the pld setup during your 
due course of research so as i said pld is mostly used for magnetic material or ceramic materials so these kind of materials they those are not easy to you know directly purchase from the market mostly this materials are chemically synthesized in some of the labs and the result of those chemical synthesis is mostly powder form now once you have this powder which you have made in your lab okay so then you need to make a pellet out of it which is also known as the pld target which is similar to something that looks like our crocine tablet so we need to make a pellet so for that now um the thing is iit bnf when it was initially um when it came into existence so we had few deliverables so that time it was a sema specific laboratory and hence the contamination policies and the rules were based on the cmos grade materials so we are still uh, the main important part of our contamination policy is we do not allow sodium and potassium into the lab since they are lifetime uh, so the lifetime uh, decreases what we do is sodium potassium materials are strictly prohibited in iit bnf lab in most of the tools so when when i say the pld4 is you open for uncontrolled access it means uh, you can use the materials which you have synthesized in your college your labs or anywhere you can use that tar target or that tablet into pld4 and do deposition based on that the only thing that we will take care here is whatever material that you have synthesized your ceramic material or magnetic material we would check it for sodium and potassium contamination so how do we do that is i'll talk during the due course of anti contamination so we check for sodium potassium contamination if it is found clear we allow your material to be mounted into the pld chamber and you can go ahead just the thin film deposition thin film deposition itself is a very great area of research and pld forms a uh, you know significant part of it so it is not just uh, restricted to fabrication but we also have been looking into projects that are only dealing with thin film deposition using different tools so pld4 is open and it is uncontrolled access provided it follows the anti contamination protocol set up by iit bnf moving ahead we have ald tools we have two ald tools one is with load lock and one is without load lock so uh, the uh, thing is in ald all of you must be aware i'll just give you in short what ald does is ald uses reactive chemistry which gives us thin film one atomic layer at a time so it has a inductively coupled plasma that allows very low temperature ald deposition it is a self limiting sorry it is a self limiting process and it has high conformal deposition with high aspect ratio how does this happen is you know it consists of uh, various uh, gases precursors so if you have a material to be deposited using ald you will have this uh, combination of many precursors so what happens is you have this chamber that is in high vacuum and then you sequentially send this pulses of gases which are also precursor gases and that is sent in some fixed amount so those gaseous precursors they react with the substrate by themselves in a self limiting process till the entire material is utilized which gives one mono layer at a time very 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 um, high quality of deposition or you can say uh, self limiting reaction then after that we ensure that whatever precursor we have sent initially that is purged out so to ensure that what we do is we purge in an inert gas mostly argon and ensure that the remaining precursor which was earlier pur purged in moves out then we send the second cycle so ald basically gets its deposition in a series of cycles which is called as a half cycle in the first part and a complete cycle so there are these cycles of ald which gives you one mono layer deposition at a time and you get a very high quality of your thin films so at iit mumbai we have few materials that i'll show in my next slide which we deposit mostly tio2 or we can go al203 
now as uh, i have explained you this process is not that simple hence ald has its own restriction on the thickness limitation and at iit bombay uh, the limitation for ald tools is 15 nanometers of deposition 15 that is the restriction or that is the mag- maximum thickness that can be deposited one time using our ald tools moving on to the next one we have a hot wire cvd that you can uh, see on the left hand side below corner so this hot wire cvd system is a chemical vapor deposition system and this was indigenously built up by iit bombay students it was from scratch so um, how does this work is it is almost similar to any cvd system uh, it has four different chambers which are dedicated for four different materials and as the name suggests you have a tungsten filament which is heated to a very high temperature and then you purge in the required gases for chemical reaction since the tungsten filament is heated to a very high temperature what happens is the radicals or the gas gases that go inside those react with that due to the high temperature they uh, you know they split up into the radicals and they react among themselves and gets deposited or adsorbed onto the surface so this is how the hot wire cvd works and we mostly do polysilicon deposition or we go ahead with silicon nitride in hot wire cvd at iit bnf <clears throat> next you can see is the rtp tool the rtp tool is nothing but the rapid thermal processing now mostly when i started my talk i said we'll be dealing with the deposition tool so rtp uh, if we look at look at it uh, in a wide sense it is not exactly a deposition tool but i have put it here because at iit bnf we use it not only as an annealing system but also as a growth tool so uh, in rtp what happens is the temperature rises to a few hundreds of degrees in a matter of few seconds and then uh, you do the processing so now what happens is this tool is mostly used uh, after implantation okay so that is one use then second use is suppose i have a silicon oxide or oh, sorry i have a silicon wafer i need to grow a very thin oxide for some tantal oxide thing so or i need a very thin layer of around few nanometers say 5 to 15 or 12 nanometers so rtp is the best tool you send in oxygen gas and once rtp is done for that silicon wafer what you get is a result as some oxide which is as thin as 5 to 12 nanometers so i have put it as a growth tool also moving on to the next slide there are few other deposition tools also that we have or i would not say deposition maybe deposition and growth is the appropriate word so we have molecular beam epitaxy here also as i said we have uh, three different we have different tools that are dedicated for different materials so here also in molecular beam epitaxy we have three mbs dedicated for three different category of materials in mbe what happens is it is mostly used for growth of single crystals so for example you can you uh, consider any single crystal may be silicon germanium gallium arsenide uh, the deposition takes place in a way or the growth you take a very thin substrate of a highly crystalline material then you have uh, uh, guns that are called as effusion cells this effusion cells they heat your uh, material to be grown at a very high temperature and this effusion cells give out Uh, those gases materials onto the substrate which is already at high temperature at regular intervals in that case what happens is the molecules um, react with the substrate and give you a very high quality of crystalline grown sing material so in that case uh, we have three molecular beam epitaxy setups which are dedicated for three different groups one is for silicon uh, one is for uh, 3 5 and uh, one is for germanium so next we move to plasma immersion 
iron implantation so iron implantation if you look at it the complete way iron implantation itself form a very a great part of physics and it is used for many experiments right from your nuclear to your material modifications um to na nanostructure formation so uh, here normally we use i uh, this plasma immersion iron implantation at iit bombay is also indigenously developed by the iit bombay students and the here this is a very shallow implanter so here we you can get implantation up to a maximum implantation depth of around uh, 150 nanometers that is how it is optimized and this was a very old system which was developed some around 10 12 years back now recently we have also purchased a new plasma doping system which is uh, now in use and we are still setting the baseline recipes so this is also used for implantation purposes this is the overview of all the deposition tools and capabilities that we have at iit bombay so uh, what what are the materials that can be deposited and what are the substrates that are allowed includes the deposition temperature gases and the substrate size so if you move uh, from the second uh, column top to bottom if you see the so in hot wire cvd what you can see is we can go ahead with the deposition of intrinsic polysilicon boron dope polysilicon and silicon nitride allowed substrates are only silicon and quartz the deposition temperature is mentioned and the gases are also mentioned and the maximum substrate size is also given for your reference same is for pld so pld actually i would not say that this table covers all the materials that we use at iit bombay uh, but we have tried to put in few materials there are a series of materials that are Uh, allowed and used uh, i'll give you the link also and i'll show you the uh, details where you can find all the available and allowed tools sorry materials moving ahead with ald we have hafnium oxide and zincorium oxide so as i said you have two alds so one is dedicated only for hafnium oxide and zirconium oxide the second one has uh, tio2 tin and aln apart from the available materials moving on to icp cvd we have undo polysilicon silicon nitride sio2 also then we have mbe that is used for epitaxial growth then we also have rtp that is used for ultra thin silicon oxide growth we have the pds doping system and p triple i that is also a doping system then as i had shown you in the process flow the second step if you see oxidation okay so um, oxidation is very important sometimes it is used as a sacrificial layer sometimes you need a tunnel oxide so in majority of the fabrication steps the next step immediately after your rca cleaning forms your oxidation so we have many furnaces which are not only dedicated to oxide but we have also some doping uh, furnaces we also have some annealing furnaces so this part of uh, the slide will give you an overview of what are the furnaces details that we have at iit bns so uh, we have two inch furnaces and uh, i'll go in order from uh, the column wise so we have dry oxidation and wet oxidation the difference is we have an oxidation furnace when we talk about a dry oxidation uh we have a silicon wafer that is uh, uh, in the furnace tube and it is heated at a very high temperature what happens is then you purge in or you send in the oxygen uh, gas and uh, this oxygen at very high temperature reacts with silicon and helps in growth of silicon oxide but dry oxidation has only oxygen and the growth is very slow process for silicon oxide hence for dry oxidation you will get a thickness that it, that is up to maximum of, of around 250 microns of sio2 layer using dry oxidation if we move to wet oxidation the process is quite similar to that of dry oxidation uh, considering the only difference is along with oxygen we also put in water vapor how it helps is it acts or it speeds up the growth and you can get an oxide up to 1 micron 
but there is a significant difference between the quality of oxide that you get using dry oxidation and wet oxidation dry oxide is always preferred for uh, gate oxide or something whereas if you are not much keen on to the oxide quality or you just need a sacrificial layer you can go ahead with the wet oxidation the time required for both of them however remains the same the only difference is the thickness that you get during the two processes then we have a separate nitrogen annealing furnace which is dedicated only for nitrogen annealing then we have a cmos fga furnace that is forming gas annealing then we have a general purpose fga now uh, like i explained for pld we have a separate pld four which is having an uncontrolled access similar is the purpose for this furnace so uh, uh, another same example i would given the similar lines that is mostly when you do some kind of deposition um so most of the i would say deposition tools or the film quality is amorphous so in that case if you need a crystalline film quality you need to anneal your films so for that you require a furnace annealing in that case in this general purpose fg annealing we have a separate tube that is called as organic tube wherein you can use your outside samples or side samples which are not um, uh, maybe uh, the deposition is not carried out at iit bombay also but you need an annealing setup so in that case you can use this general purpose annealing furnace we have a dedicated tube so similarly we have end of silicon and p dop silicon using furnaces every furnace has a wafer capacity of maximum 25 wafers at a time 2 inch wafers now here uh, we have tried to summarize sio2 is a very crucial um, step in our fabrication uh, so we have tried to summarize you can do sio2 deposition as well as growth both the techniques i have been explaining in the past few slides uh, we have only uh, put here or categorized it into form of growth that is mostly the oxidation part because in oxidation your wafer is partly used up to grow the oxide whereas some tools like maybe sputter tools where you have an sio2 target and the sio2 deposition takes place so the difference is when i talk about growth it will utilize or it will partly take up your wafer and give you an oxide and deposition you will have an oxide target which will will just be deposited so these are all the tools or all the tools and their specifications that i have discussed in the past slides so we have an rtp so it gives from the 3 nanometer to 20 nanometer then we have dry oxidation we have wet oxidation we have our sputter tool which is a deposition tool we have icp cvd which we have discussed we also have a dry dielectric sputter which is also a deposition tool and we also have these furnaces where you can deposit the si oh, sorry where you can grow the si so as you can see here you can see i have written here mentioned specifically altec dry oxidation furnaces so altec furnaces have 4 inch wafer capability whereas what we have discussed in the earlier slide was only 2 inch wafer capacities capabilities then i move ahead with the metal deposition so um, the thing is if you look at it in the fabrication step wise flow then i guess uh, you should have a fabrication uh, tool like maybe an uh, photolithography tool that comes into between but the flow is i'll go ahead with the deposition tool so uh, as we have different dedicated tools the deposition tools are mostly the metal deposition what i'm talking about is for contacts so here we have categorized this broadly into two three categories that is sputtering electron beam evaporation and the thermal evaporation so uh, everyone must be here familiar with the thermal and the e beam evaporation it is a very very old and very nice tool which gives you a very good quality of metal deposition but uh, then comes our sputtering tool but every tool has its own limitations and uh, advantages depending on what do we want to use it for for example uh, just uh, quickly i will tell you thermal evaporation is something that you have a boat kind of structure and you have your substrates that are placed on the top of the um, that boat and uh, the material is heated in the boat 
which evaporates and gets deposited onto your substrate similar is the ebm evaporation the only difference is here you heat the board by resistive heating electron beam you use a beam of electrons to heat your material sputtering is something that you sputter your materials and the material gets deposited so as you can see we have summarized here uh, the evaporation techniques be thermal evaporation or ebm evaporation these are very good for lift off it is very simple technique reliable consistent but if you have some feature feature means some pattern kind of thing it will not give you a step coverage it will not cover it will just deposit a very good quality of film with lift off then whereas if you go for the sputtering it will not give a very good lift off but it will give you a very good step coverage it will cover all the areas where you have your pattern also so here we have uh, different tools which are repeatable but which are dedicated for different materials which i will be showing in the next slide so we have your thermal evaporator that is for metals we have multi crucible electron beam evaporator we have the metal sputter dielectric sputter orion sputter and these are the tool capabilities so we have a thermal evaporator that is only dedicated for aluminium we also have a thermal evaporator that is dedicated for chrome gold evaporation and then we have a four target ebm evaporator where you can deposit all the uh, all these materials the sputter orion emat al so emat actually applied materials lab had sponsored iit uh, bombay nano fabrication facility and uh, they had taken a part of the lab one area where they had uh, dedicatedly set up their lab for 8 inch manufacturing process cmos structures uh, over a period of time uh, the lab become became more and more utilized for research purposes and hence the lab was limited only to the usage of 2 to 4 inch wafers so this emat tools are still there you might I'll, it will be there all around in the talk somewhere you will be able to see etchers are also there so these are dedicated only for 8 inch wafers now moving to lithography system so uh, uh, lithography is how do we do lithography uh, we have tried to explain in a very nice way here in very simple way so this is what you have a substrate the first image that you can see a substrate and a material this is what you want a patterned material onto the substrate what we do is we coat the material with a resist which is also called as a photo resist and then we expose it to uv light after exposure you develop it so what happens is let me go to the second part the resist coating the resist is nothing but you know it is a kind of polymers that we have and these are special kind of crosslink polymers uh, the properties are light dependent hence uh, always what you will see is the lithography is carried out in the yellow rooms because they are very sensitive to light so what happens is every resist uh, can be either a negative photo resist it goes into much detail so there are negative positive photo resist uh, to be explaining it in the layman terms is you have two kinds of resist one which hardens when exposed to light second it softens when it is exposed to light so we coat the wafer using the resist we deposit your material we coat the wafer using the resist and then we do the exposure so when you do the exposure the area where you want your deposition excuse me ma'am yes uh, ma'am i have a question why we yes. need this uh, hard uh, uh, that is uh, uh, this hard and soft type of uh, material like this uh, resist you are talking about right yeah. yes ma'am yeah yeah i will come in my slide in the next slide after next slide if you are still not clear please uh, uh, redo uh, like ask your question again okay okay yeah okay so this is something that i want okay now here uh, which means i need to protect this uh, part this uh, small squares that you you are seeing so what i'll do is i'll coat it with the resist and 
I will do the exposure with a particular resistile code. So what happens is after exposure, whatever part I need my structure that will get hardened. So once it gets hardened, the material below it is protected because that hardened part will protect the thin film or the target material that is below my that resist, which is hardened now. Now, once the resistor is hardened, what you do is etching. So after lithography, you have a significant step that is called as etching. Etching means uh, it is a, a kind of you know solvent, which is a mixture of solvent. Uh, so it is called as etchant. So suppose I have this yellow, I can say a gold film. OK, then I have this resist red color. After exposure, this it has become this blue part, which is now hardened and it is protect. It is going to protect that area exactly which is beneath that resist. What I do is now I put it in a gold etchant. What the etchant will do is etchant will remove all the gold that is seized onto the substrate. Since you have this blue color ka resist here, that gold which is beneath that resist will be protected because the agent will not be able to see that gold. The resist is protecting that gold. Then as the agent removes or dissolves the remaining gold, what you are left with is this structure that you can see you have the blue hardened resist and you have the yellow gold which is now patterned. Now what we need is this structure. We just need a silicon substrate that you can see a blue one, lighter blue, and you need on top the uh, patterned gold. So what we'll do is this resist uh, will now put in acetone after this fifth, fifth step. And once you put it in acetone, the resist will go away and you will get your this pattern structure. So this is one kind of etching. OK, so now suppose if I have structures here. OK, and um, it is a very um, complicated structure, then you can also go for lift off. So etching and lift off are two processes. So when you do lift off, it means uh, you deposit some material. OK, then when you expose it, the part where you want the material to be staying along goes away. And the remaining part has um, the resist and the material. Uh, let me show you one slide, which will give you an idea about the lift off process. OK. Yes, OK. So this will give you an idea about the question that you have asked. So this is a thin film material, the green one that you can see. What you do is you coat and pattern the photoresist. OK, then you etch the remaining film. So the green color goes away. And then now you remove the photoresist. This is etching what I've just explained. Now, when the other type of photoresist will be used is this part, lift off. OK, what you do is coat and pattern. So here you want the deposition here so here you will be using that photoresist which after development will soften and go away so after development this part will soften and it will go away then you will deposit your film and you put it in acetone so this red part which is the resist now as soon as you put it in acetone will lift off so it is something like this i can give you an example you have a square block okay on top of that you put um, you have a square you you take a, a table you put two square boxes there okay and then you just put a layer of water and you just take up the square bro boxes so what you are left up with left is you are left is with the water layer that is on the table and the square boxes along with themselves lift the water that is on the square boxes that is called lift off so this resist lift off the metal film this is normally used in the cases where we do not have etching so there are materials like platinum which itself is costly but we do not uh, you know uh, it is very difficult to get a etching for platinum and if you have it it is very costly so for materials like that we prefer using lift off where we do not have the etching or getting an etching is costly does that answer my question? It answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
So I'll just go back to this process. Then how do you do the patterning? Now, when you move to the patterning, uh, you have two kinds of lithographies, basically. One is photolithography that is used for microfabrication. And then you have EBL, electron beam lithography, that is used for nanofabrication. So uh, basic structure is for any uh, process, you have the mask design, you make a mask, you design your pattern, then you write the mask, then you expose the same mask on the wafer. So how do you do that is in these steps. You uh, put it with the resist, expose it to the source, and then you develop it, which was there in the lift off thing. So how do you do this process? I will just show by images. Can you see uh, uh, this image, which is to your right hand side? Yes, ma'am. So there you see a circle here where my where the cursor is pointing. Ah uh, yes, it is in gray color. Yes, right, exactly. So you have uh, something that is called as a hard mask. So as I said, there are two kinds of lithography that you can go ahead with. That is photolithography, which is in micron range. Then you have uh, EBL lithography that is in nanometer range. So I'll be very specific at IIT Bombay. We have both the tools for photolithography. First, I'll talk about, then I'll move to the nanolithography. So when you talk about photolithography, we have something that is called as a laser writer. Laser writer is something that writes a mask. I'll just show you the laser writer. Okay, this is the system. So here you have nothing but a square piece of glass i can say and you have iron oxide coated on those glass what you do is you feed in your design to the computer which is in line with your two inch silicon wafer you feed that design into the computer and the laser writer writes mask okay after writing you get that design printed onto the uh, that square mask that mask can be reused and reutilized time and again that is called as hard mask then what you do is that square uh, this um, gray part what i have shown you your remains your silicon wafer inside you can see the white part and on top of this stays your mask that is the hard mask or the square part that you have just printed then using this several lenses you expose it in uv light this is your lithography setup which is called as uh, mjb4 mask aligner and after exposure the same process happens that i've explained the resist hardens softens and then you develop it this is the mask aligner that we have so when it comes to microfabrication at iit bombay for minimum feature size we, what we have kept what we have here is five micron below five micron if you have anything we move to ebl or electron beam lithography up to nanometer range Whereas if you have something as it has a lower limit, similarly, it also has an upper limit. So the upper limit in that case is 50, 50 microns. So if you have something that is around 50 microns, so every design will have a minimum feature size and it will have a maximum feature size. So minimum feature size, if it is five, we go ahead with laser writer and MJB4 for your lithography process. If it is below five, we go ahead with EBL. If it is minimum 50 or it is just the lowest one is 50 microns, you can get it printed from outside because the laser editor takes up a lot of time to write those mass files. So we have a few contacts, not contact sources. We can give you the addresses. So mostly this is done for designs like microfluidic channels where people do not have such small features. Uh, so we get it printed on a transparency sheet we stick it onto the plate and we follow the same process so this is how it goes for microfabrication here these are the tools that we have we have two mjb4 which are used for microfabrication or photolithography we also have a dsa or that is called as a double sided aligner so it is not only used for uh, uh, the top alignment but sometimes you need to do back etching especially when you need to release the wafers or something. So that time you need this DSA or the double sided aligner. So that is used uh, for backside, backside alignment. So that is also part of photolithography. 
So MJB3 and MJB4 are similar kind of setup. We just have two different tools. Then as I said, laser writer, what we have is for writing the mass. mass. But uh, here, the laser writer can also do writing directly on your silicon wafer. Why we do not use it to write directly on the silicon wafer is because we already have these three tools, MJB3, MJB4, and uh, DSA for writing, uh, for exposure. So laser writer helps in that sense. Once you write this hard mask, you can time and again use the same mask to just expose the wafer and develop it. So this is all regarding the photolithography. When I say EBL, now you have something that is less than 5 microns. We come to rate. Rate is our electron beam writing or electron beam um, system where we can write feature size of minimum up to 40 nanometers. So here our only limitation is uh, whenever you design your mask, it should be such that uh, uh, all the features, including distance between the uh, uh, two features, or we can say pitch, that is that should be 40 nanometers. So all uh, features should be above 40 nanometers, but below 5 microns. That is the limitation for rate. So I can show you here. These are the images. These are MJB3 and MJB4 setups. This is our DSA. Though it is not taken in yellow light, it is in yellow room. The laser writer is also in yellow room. This is our rate setup. So rate, along with it, has its own SEM. SEM is uh, used for imaging of the sample to check whether whatever features you have written, those are correct or not. This is what I had gone through earlier. So now we have covered deposition. We have covered lithography. Now we move to the etching techniques. So etching, as I said, you can either lift off or you can etch. So you can etch using the etchant. Lift off, everyone is clear. So it is just going to lift off. The resistor is just going to lift off your material. When you come to etching, etching can be done in two ways. So uh, we have dry etching and we have wet etching. What I explained earlier was wet etching, that you pattern the wafer, you develop it, you just put it into some solvent and you keep it there for some time and the etching takes place. The uh, etchant will dissolve the relevant metal. Now, there are also a uh, few dry etching tools which are called as reactive ion etching tools. So what happens in reactive ion etching is there is chemistry uh, between these gases, which are mostly fluorine, chlorine gases. And those, along with plasma, they react with the material that is to be etched and they etch out the material. So that is how uh, dry etching is carried out. So we have few dry etching tools also at IIT BNF, which are summarized in the next slide. So here we have FTSRI. We have ICPRI, uh, we have plasma etcher, we have AMAT etcher, we have deep RI. So here, um, these different reactive ion etching tools have different gas compositions and different power bias so that it can etch out different materials as you can see. For example, STSRI, you can etch silicon polysilicon, silicon nitride and silicon oxide for two inch wafers. We have all the uh, recipes that are standard and we have uh, optimized it for this particular materials and those are there on our website then you have icpri which are dedicated only for gallium nitride and gallium arsenic so we have two icpris in this case uh, plasma asher is this is also indigenously built up system at iit bombay so basically it is used only for ashing but uh, this asher can also be used for etching of few materials. Then you have the AMAT etcher, uh, which is there for 8 inch wafers. And deep RI, um, it is used for etching of silicon and diamond. And it will give you a very high aspect ratio. And um, you can etch to and through features. I'll just show you a few images later on how this DRI images are there. OK, so these are the images. We have the RI system. So this is the STS model. We also have one Centec model, same system. Then this is the deep RI system. The H rate is 55 microns per minute for silicon. 
okay so now we have covered almost all the things apart from the characterization so since um, the uh, uh, you know the seminar is related to mems i would like to here i have just briefly explained we have a silicon wafer and these are how our cantilevers look like so you have a sacrificial layer that is sio2 then you have an encapsulation layer where you spin coat the su8 su8 is also a kind of resist here the recipe is given you just please need not go into much details about it just all the um, specs are given of the recipe then after that once you pattern this su8 resist you need you need contacts so for contacts we normally use chromium gold so here we have uh, 20 nanometers chromium and gold and then you do you go for a second level litho which gives you this red pattern that you can see this structure which looks like after gold and chrome etching you will you will get something like this and the final releasing of cantilevers is from below this is the image of one of the cantilever that is fabricated at iit bombay nano fabrication so for backside etching here you will need dsa for alignment and this is how the cantilevers will be looking after once they are released this is the imaging is also carried out at iit bombay so similarly we have fabricated many uh, similar kind of devices so to name a few these are few structures that we have uh, fabricated at iit bombay uh, we have the silicon dioxide microheaters we have uh, microfluidic channels then we also have a mems cantilever and this is what i was talking about through and through edge using dpri so you can see the small holes this is just nothing but through and through edge in silicon so moving ahead now now it comes to a general part of material and structural characterization so as i said uh, we are not just restricting ourselves to the fabrication facilities but if anybody who just wants to go ahead with characterization of the materials uh, we are open to just using the characterization facilities also so we have a afm facility in house afm is uh, normally used for surface imaging the to see the topography of any film it works in contact mode non contact mode and tapping mode Uh, the sample size what we need would be maximum 2 cm by 2 cm and it gives a very good resolution of around in armstrong range then we have an ellipsometer ellipsometer is a technique that works on polarization of light uh, and it is used for finding out the dielectric properties as well as the thickness measurement of oxide materials uh ellipsometer restricts itself only to oxide materials we cannot do any metal uh, or thin film uh, any metallic thin film thickness measurement using this so uh, here at iit mumbai we normally use the ellip ellipsometer after oxide growth or after any um, you know deposition of sio2 to check for the uniformity and the thickness of the oxide then we have an olympus microscope that is used for uh, looking at the feature size post development we also have a contact angle measurement uh, this is normally used to measure the um, uh, you know things like surface energy and uh, surface tension of the sample it also uh, gives you the uh, the properties of that particular material on which you are going to check the contact angle measurement then ftir system so ftir system uh, is normally used for uh, uh, finding out the bonding between the different uh, you know different materials so whatever you have deposited or uh, any other thing um, so we also have ftir we have two ftirs at iit bnf then we have uh, hr xrd we can do all this kind of measurements measurements in the sense we can do uh, theta to theta then we can do uh, maybe reflectivity measurements also and all the um, different uh, things like layer thickness layer composition or phase or defects calculation can be done using those measurements 
uh, we have restricted uh, this HRXRD. We have not restricted. Actually, the system restriction is uh, you cannot go ahead with powder samples. In that case, you have to drop cast your sample on a thin film in such a way that the powder does not come out. So the only limitation here we have is we cannot go ahead with the HRXRD of powder samples. Then we have an XPS setup. XPS is a very important uh, tool, another characterization tool that gives us the uh, you know, elemental composition of a particular thin film. XPS can be used in different modes. So uh, the XPS that we have currently right now at IIT BNF will give you the elemental composition of the thin film that you have deposited or you have used for your research. Uh, also, you can go ahead with uh, calculation of band gap by using some data from XPS. And we also have uh, depth profiling. So in depth profiling, what happens is the it will take the uh, surface elemental composition of the particular film. Then you will be bombarding those uh, by using some argon atoms. And uh, then again, you will take the elemental composition. Again, you will go ahead and you will bombard the film with argon atoms. So depth-wise, you will be getting the elemental composition of particular material. It not only helps in uh, checking whether you have any uh, uh, contamination in your films, but it also helps in checking the uh, energy values or the binding energies of that particular material. Then we have this Brooker or Dectac profilometer. So it is one of the uh, profilometry technique that is used for measurement of thickness, or I can say um, feature me uh, measurement of the size of feature. So as you can see here uh, down in the image that is shown, suppose I have uh, uh, fabricated a structure that looks something like this. So you have some uh, tunnels or you have some squares here. What this profilometer does is it is a stylus profilometer. It will uh, the, it has a tip which has a very minimum amount of force. The tip will fall onto the substrate. It will just go ahead with the mechanical stylus kind of thing where it sees a dip or a step. It will go down the same way and it will give you a almost similar pattern of how the structure looks like. So this is mostly used to measure the depth after etching or development. We have another profilometer. So this will give you a very good quality or of a very good um, control over the measurement. We have one more profilometer that is the unbiased profilometer. But uh, the only difference here is Ambios will give us very good results only if the features are in um, some hundreds of microns. When it comes to less than that, DECTA gives a better result. Next, we move to UV visible spectrometer. UV visible uh, is mostly used for measurement of band gaps. Uh, it can also be done in three modes, reflectance, transmittance, and absorption mode. Absorption is the most commonly used. And it can be used during your process of fabrication, or it can be used other way around also, apart from your fabrication thing. We also have a PL setup. Um, the, uh, with, the, with this current PL, what we have is we have a standard uh, laser that is 532 na nanometer. Earlier, we had one more laser, but uh, that is not working right now. So we have now only one laser that is 532 nanometer. and Hence, we can check for the layer composition and thickness of those specific materials that uh, give us the, that has the excitation wavelength of around this uh, values. We also have a cross stem sample preparation. So now, um, cross stem is, uh, so you have to go ahead with cross stem, I would say TEM. TEM is nothing but transmission electron microscopy. TEM is a very high, um, hmm, what I can say, very sophisticated technique that will give you very precise results of your nanometer level imaging uh, materials also. So if you have formed some nanostructures that range from suppose 5 to 10 nanometers, TM is the best imaging techniques that will give you your imaging of those materials. It has very high precision and it has a very good quality of lenses. So. Um, not necessary all the time you have materials that give you direct imaging. Uh, so there can be powder materials, 
there can be thin films and there can be uh, layer or multi layer thin films so here you can do your tem in three ways one is uh, you know it has a very thin copper grid so if you have a powder material you have to just dispense it into a solvent you have to mix it properly and then drop cast that solvent onto the copper grid you have to let it dry under the uv light for few hours and then your sample is ready for imaging that is for powder when it comes to thin films and if you need to see the interface like how is your interface reacting you have to do something that is called as xtm which also stands for cross stem sample preparation so for that you need to specifically prepare the sample it is a very tedious very time consuming and very um, you know the technique that requires very high patience so um, i so these are all the tools that are required for just one sample preparation in the next slide i have shown how it goes so you know you have this is the tentative flow chart you have a thin film what you do is you have this rectangular cutter and you cut very small rectangular blocks out of it so you can see here 1 2 3 4 5 6 so these are rectangular wafers so this 3 4 are your actual film and 4 5 are dummy wafer because it is a, a mechanical process that might harm your film so we take two dummy wafers then what you do is the two wafers which are your actual film wafers you glue it using a specific kind of glue and then what you do is you heat it on a hot plate so when you heat it on a hot plate then the binding becomes very strong then you again put some mechanical pressure and you get this gluing kind of uh, box that you have seen the green yellow and the red one so those are all glued together then you use a cylindrical cutter and you get something that is uh, shown below so those are cut into form of small disc now this discs are nothing but you can see those small bindi kind of thing that uh, that is the level of cutting of the uh, cylindrical cutter then you need to polish it so you take the lapping tool here here you can see the lapping tool you just put or you stick it on that uh, uh, lapping precision uh, the top machine that you see and you grind it slowly onto the paper so here it requires a lot of patience and you have to grind it till the thickness goes up to some 100 microns you measure the thickness you grind it again you measure the thickness you polish it again so you have to redo this process lot of times once that is done what you do is you use a dimpler and that 100 microns you further reduce to some 50 60 microns so the film has now become very very thin and it is very very fragile once that is done you use an iron beam to form a i shaped structure like our eyes so it is a i shaped structure that closes or that covers that your sample is ready for now imaging why is that i shaped structure required is as the name suggests it is transmission electron microscopy so that i shaped structure allows the electron to transmit and give you a overall picture of the images or sorry of the interface of the film so this is the entire setup and we have this sample preparation technique at iit bnf however we still do not have a tem setup so the tem is carried out at saif iit bombay but we do prepare samples for tem so these are overall uh, range of uh, things that we have uh, so to summarize we have an ellipsometer uh that we can measure from 1 nanometer to 100 micro uh, micrometer and then um we have a dectac from 6 to 200 nanometers embers from 25 to 300 nanometers so micrometers afm 50 nanometers to millimeter sizes then we have film matrix which is also similar to ellipsometry for thickness measurement from 4 nanometers to 20 microns uh evio sem to measure or to see the sem imaging and ebl sem 10 nanometer to millimeter range then we have few electrical characterization tools also a uh, few of them are uh, we have some five tools that you have mentioned but we have more right now so we have a phoenix tool uh, which is high temperature ivcv tool we have a proxima which is a ivcv iv measurement tool we have a cv measurement result tool and stress measurement and room temperature ivcv measure 
so these are just the images i have shown just two images one is a um, kitli tool and then uh, you have one with the thermochuck full probe station now moving ahead with the miscellaneous tools so apart from fabrication we have few tools which might come under the category of uh, miscellaneous because that do not come uh, totally under fabrication or totally under characterization so those are uh, we have our laser engraving system what happens is we have this uh, laser uh, with very high power and it cuts through and through to different sheets so uh, here we can cut uh, or we can i would not say cut we can engrave on polycarbonate sheets of around 1 mm thickness even acrylic sheets or glass slides also so here we have given the thicknesses that can be engraved moving ahead we also have a wafer bonder so wafer bonder is mostly used when you need to bond two wafers so for example we have one wafer and the second wafer uh, and then you have this bond chart so there are aligners so there are those have alignment mark from wafer to wafer and those are then uh, you know pressed together with some contact force and you get the bonded wafers this is how the wafer bonder works so similar to wafer bonder you also might need uh, something that bonds wire so you have a wire bonder that connects from the wires to the different uh, smaller features so this is how um, we have a wafer bonder and wire bonder in miscellaneous uh, then uh, we also have many things that we have not mentioned for maintenance like we have the scrubbers we have uh, uh, different humidity uh, this humidifier measurements we have gas line measurements uh, to control uh, so all those things are also a part of miscellaneous next we move to the anti contamination policy um I, we follow the stanford nanofabrication facility methodology and we have uh, you know categorized our tool into clean semi clean gold contaminated and lithium analytical so just to give a glimpse the highest category is clean where we have all our rca clean wafers then we have semi clean a semi clean b gold contaminated and we have lithium analytical all the lithography tools or all the characterization tools. uh so now i move to how do you see the website and all the facilities and where do you find these so initially when the facility was established it came up as the center of excellence in nano electronics so it was funded by the ministry and it was placed at two centers one is iit bombay and second one is iisc uh so hence the website still has uh, the name of center of excellence in nano electronics it is now called as iit bnf nano fabrication facility so to um, have uh, to have this uh, facilities open up to uh, entire country uh, there was a program that was laid forward by the ministry it was funded by uh, ministry which was termed as the indian nano electronics users program so uh, we have successfully completed two phases of the programs and the program has been very helpful for researchers all over india uh, because the idea behind this entire thing was instead of a user or faculty member writing a proposal going to the funding agency uh, dealing with the ministry people then getting approvals the basic funda was they would write proposal to the center of excellence or the inup through inup they would write the proposals it would be checked for technical feasibility and novelty and other factors by a team of uh, expertise and faculty member and once the proposal is approved right from issuing a silicon wafer to your complete device fabrication was under the inup program it was granted under the inup program so this program has been very helpful to all the students and we are currently um, we have completed two inup phases uh, and uh, the third phase we are expecting shortly but as of now since inup is not in picture the facilities are open to usage on payment basis um so uh, for that what you can do is i'll tell you in the next slide but i'll just show you whatever i have explained how do you go and check for those this is open to all the users you can anytime visit the iit bnf or the cen facility you can see online modules when you click on that you will see something that looks like this and when you click on the live equipment status you will see all the tools that are there in our lab
IIT BNF. If you click on any particular tool, for example, your plasma immersion, you will get all the details. What is the make model? Who is the person in charge? What are allowed? What is not allowed? What are the contamination remarks? So you need, not, you need not log into anything to have access to these things. You have to just open the website. You have access to all those things. Then now how to use the facility? Uh, we are uh, uh, in process of having the online portal uh, to use the facility. Till then, uh, we have our uh, uh, program manager, Dr. Nageshwari, who is in charge of uh, how to use the facility. So you can send your request to her email ID and we'll take it from there. So uh, what are the things that I would like to tell if you want to use the facility? What are the things that you need to specifically mention? If you need to use only the characterization tools, you just need to tell what is your sample, what are the number of samples, that's it. And which tool you need. Or if you're not even aware which tool would be better for you, for example, you need an imaging tool. But you don't know whether AFM would be better or SEM would be better, or you need to go with them. So in that case also, you can write to us. We are very uh, open and we are here to help you out with that thing. Now, second comes the fabrication thing. So when it comes to fabrication request, we would need further details. So uh, the initial stage, you can just send a mail and we will get back to you with whatever details we need. So this is her contact email ID. This is the website that you can see. And this is my information. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam, for uh, uh, your session. Uh, uh, I will. Uh, we can take some uh, questions here. So, participants, if you are having some questions, please go ahead. Yes, sure. Uh, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, 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 you are audible. Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, I am working with uh, this cantilever technology, and uh, thank you so much for wonderful uh, uh, knowledge to us to uh, get this fabrication. And I have a question regarding that. Uh, while we making this uh, thin film uh, fabrication or uh, thin film coating on the surfaces, uh, uh, it is very difficult to get a, a proper imaging or a, a proper uh, clarity to the uh, when we, if you want to study more in the surface studies, so uh, uh, from uh, how we can uh, overcome that, ma'am? Um, so if you just need to look at uh, how uniform is your surface, uh, is that what you're talking about? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So uh, mostly in that case, we would suggest uh, semi imaging. So there is something uh, that is if you are looking at a metal film, uh, then uh, we would uh, also suggest. Um, Mm, okay, SEM is the perfect one, or you can go ahead with AFM, which will also give you the roughness in your film along with the topography of the film. So in that case, what you need to do is when you deposit a film, uh, your substrate uh, holder will always have multiple substrate deposition uh, uh, patches, or I can say you can deposit multiple films. So you have to always take a spare film, which you can consider for these kind of uh, characterization. So even if... Uh, it is a spare or a film which even gets, um, uh, you know, you cannot use it further after all these characterization is okay. So uh, in that case, you can do AFM and SEM. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, is there anything, uh, if it is once we done, uh, uh, we will get that film back or uh, uh, how we can, the sample we are getting back or it will be completely used for your studies? No, no, you, no you, can, you can get it back. See, SEM uh, okay. will not uh, harm your sample in any way. So you can get it back. So for a technique like XPS, uh, it is going to, uh, you know, just uh, your sample is going to be completely damaged. So it depends on the technique. You will definitely get back your sample. Okay, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank yes. you. Hello, madam. Yeah, hello. Hello, madam. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Madam, how to measure the uh, coating thickness of a cutting tool uh, by using this, uh, whatever maybe the instrument you have shown, here, the, how to measure the coating on the thickness on this uh, cutting tool? Uh, cutting tool in the sense, or uh, can you be more specific? Then, so, madam, madam, we are increasing the reliability of this cutting tool. And okay. uh, then uh, here we are the um, uh, coating on this uh, cutting tool. 
sometimes okay, so what are yes. the dimensions then how of to measure this uh, coating thickness okay so in that case sir we have if you have a sample that you can give 1 cm by some 1 cm or something we have cross sectional sem also so we have a sample holder that will help held the uh, your sample in a cross sectional way and when you go on uh, you know increasing the magnification you will be seeing two different layers one will be of your substrate and one will be of the coating so that way we can measure the thickness madam my question is again ki yeah suppose i want to measure the thickness then i have uh, this cutting tool and this uh, this coated cutting tool then okay. uh, how to make this your uh, required size of this uh, cutting tool this is okay. my problem how to cut okay. this huh. uh, okay then another thing that i would suggest is how do you coat the cutting tool sir how do you go ahead with the coating what is the process that you do the any the, the suppose the, the chemical deposition process okay then one more thing what you can do is you can take a smaller piece and you can stick a you know double sided tape that okay. is mostly used in the deposition tools and you can do the coating okay so once that is done you just remove the double sided tape that will give you a step and you have a step you can go ahead with the profilometer and just check where the step uh, uh, is there and that height will give you your thickness of the uh, coating अच्छा ओके ओके मुझे आज सुरुआती जानता की तो छोटा सा पीस तो तैयार कर ना कट कटिंग कोटिंग कर दिस इज वन प्रोसेस बट प्रीवियस सपोज द सैंडविच कटिंग टूर इज देर एंड आई हेव टू मेजर एंड दिस साइज इट मे बी दिकर देन हाउ टू डू दिस Okay, so sir, for bigger sizes, right now in our lab we do not have anything. But uh, uh, maybe I can help you. Uh, you have my email ID. Can you just note down and you can send me the image of your cutting tool? Uh, maybe I'll check on that and I'll reply uh, to you accordingly. Is that okay? Yes, 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 ma'am. Very, very. Thank you, madam. Yes, very sir. Very nice introduction, madam. Yeah, thank you, sir. Okay, so this is the first time, madam. Yeah, good afternoon, madam. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Uh, ah yeah. uh, this is um, uh, ravi shankar i um, i have done my phd and mtech from iit bombay only uh, yes, i just okay. wanted to know now in this situation now let us say this is a uh, situation like uh, pandemic and other things and the inub is spreading as wing is there any scope or any chance in the future or we are planning like remote access of uh this uh, software or some simulation software the uh, this users can do because some of the software sometime they we have to come there in iit and then do so is there any provision we are thinking on or is there any lineup thing where they can remotely use the software from wherever they want of course the processor will process will be followed it should be approved and everything so mm -hmm. is there any such thing so sir i think uh, i inup phase 3 has something uh, that is related to remote access uh, but i guess dr nageshwari is the correct person who will provide you much more information on that okay i'll communicate with Hi. dr nageshwari there yes yes sir email i have been here oh, oh she is here yeah, I'm, i am i know yeah. uh, we work together so i will talk to her also sir uh, okay. dr nageshwari is there so ha uh -huh. she is also in the call sure Hello? sure thank you Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, madam. How yeah, are you? Hello. Yeah, I am fine. How are you all? Yeah, yeah. Good, good, madam. We are doing good. I am doing good here. Uh, okay. Right now, presently in Manipal University, Dubai. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So oh, just okay. uh, because some of the uh, processes, like, are some simulations. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, many of them they don't have access to the simulation and all, and they will come as a part okay, of. Okay. Right this. now, uh, right now, no simulation to. Pardon, madam. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So no, I'm just Hello? talking any simulation tools which can be given a remote access to uh, INUP users across the India or something like that. Is there any uh, provision simulation, right now? Simulation, yeah. Simulation tools, right? So right yeah. now, all of our students' uh, simulation who all are working on the simulation, they are working on remote. Nobody is allowed to come here, no. So everybody has been given access. But uh, outsiders, I am not sure. but you can send yeah. us special request so we can uh, um, discuss with the concerned faculty and uh, no uh, we can help you out yes yeah, sure sure so that that there may be some scope for the children outside also yes yes yeah 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 thank you thank you very much you can wait yeah 
there any other question from the participants? Uh, sir, uh, my, my, uh, hello. Hello, uh, uh, yes, my one, one, one question. Uh, madam, uh, is there any simulation technique uh, to for, the, for the reliability of this cutting tool? Uh, to increase the life of this cutting tool uh, um, uh, by using the coating. Is there any simulation technique, madam? Uh, sir, we will need to know your materials. So uh, okay, along with the imaging, can you send the details? We can check and we can get back to you on this. Okay. Thick. Okay, I can help uh, you, Professor Vishnu Sinawale. I know one person, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Dre Parle, who is into the ANSYS and uh, he can help you in simulation uh, of uh, like coating tools, coating cutting tools. Okay, I can I can yeah. give him, give you your, uh, give uh, contact details of the Dr. Dr. Dre Parle to you and you can contact with him. So he, he yes, can sir, yes. Out, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very, very. Thank you, sir. Very, very. Yes, thank you, madam. Into the manufacturing, he has done the PhD from IIT Bombay into this uh, simulation of micro EDM processes on all. So he can definitely help you. And he was in the ANSYS uh, Limited, so he definitely can help you in getting the simulation of coating cutting tools. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, okay. sir. Very, very yeah. good interaction, sir. Very nice interaction for me, sir. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Yeah, any other questions? So that's all, I think. Uh, so thank you, Dipti, madam. Thank you, Nageshwari, madam, for being here. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar Dudhi, also on the board for this session. Uh, special thanks to Dipti Rukade, madam, for uh, the informative session uh, covering all, almost all the men's related fabrication processes here and also the different characterization processes and also giving the overview about the IDU program and also how to use the paid facility of the uh, which are there in IIT DLF. And uh, for all all this uh, particular, uh, this information will be useful for the participants. So definitely they will use uh, all this information in their teaching and also in their research activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran sir, and thank you all the participants. Thank you.